All right. Well, we're continuing our study in the book of James, and today we're going to look at some faith and deeds. Faith and works. You know, as I shared with you guys before, James is writing to the, the, the scattered Jewish Christians who were undergoing persecution in uh, Jerusalem area, and they've been scattered to all the nations, and so he's been addressing some things with that, telling them that, listen, in this massive trial that you're having, God is doing a work. He's not not in control. Even though you've lost homes and businesses and, and your life has been turned upside down and some of them died in the persecution and were martyred, he said, listen, it's not, it, it is for something that God is doing. Even in the midst of tragedy, it'll be good. So he says, God's maturing you, he's growing your faith, and he's developing you into a person of great character. Then he talked about temptations. And he said, listen, when you undergo severe trials, severe troubles, temptation is right at that door. Trials and temptation go together. How many have ever noticed that in your life? That when you're going through some kind of a stressful thing, all of a sudden different temptations start to flow. And a temptation is simply this. It's a, it's a deceptive thought to do an action that you think or is presented as positive for your life when actually it is destructive. So that's what temptations are. And he says, listen, you've you got an obligation to not do that. Don't give in to the temptations in your trials. Keep on doing that which is right, and God will bless you. And then he says, then he started to talk about, as we talked about last week, he talked um, uh, now, when you're in this situation, how you treat one another is very important. Because how many know when you're undergoing temptations, you're stressful? How many know when you're undergoing trials, mm, you tend to get a bit snippy? You tend to, you know, how many have driven to work and dealt, endured that trial? And you get snippy and, and short, and, and you can treat people with favoritism and, and all the judgmental stuff and all those things. He says, listen, you got to be careful because... God's kids don't act like that. That's what the world does. Today we're going to look at your jobs, your careers. What does God want in our faith? How does our faith and our work line up? Faith and deeds. So we start with this verse in James 2, 17, which everything I've already shared with you has a work aspect about it. it work simply means this. We have a do part. There is the do part. It has to accompany faith, or James says it's dead. Your faith isn't worth anything. Faith isn't just a belief. It's a lifestyle. And if your lifestyle doesn't line up with your belief, then he says your belief is dead. It's, it's a, it doesn't accomplish anything. So we're going to spend some, the rest of this morning actually looking at some of this. So in James 2.17, he says this, in the same way, after talking about trials, relationships, uh, temptation. He goes, and in the same way, so he's going to change his topic. And he goes, in the same way, faith by itself, it is, if it is not accompanied by action, is dead. It accomplishes nothing. So what is the first principle we need to understand? With God, faith is first. It is always relationship first. Then deeds. It's a big deal because if we have that backward and we think our relationship with God is based on our deeds, then we are not in relationship with God. We are in performance for God. And we are performing to be in the relationship. So God, and even James here, tells us, first of all, faith. Faith is my belief in what God says about himself and my relationship to him. And how that is formed is true. If I don't have the relationship, I will automatically go to deeds as my relationship. Any relationship you have with a person that is successful is based on the intimacy of the relationship. If I have to perform for you, you know, I, I used to, here's what I used to do in, in marriage counseling. If you came in, I would... I was, I was a rookie. I didn't know nothing. 
So uh, if you told me, you know, and we have all these problems at home, and, and he doesn't do this job, and she doesn't do that, and, and this and that, and I'd make a list of them. Do, well, you know, I figured it out for you. Just do these things, and you'll be cool. Take out the trash, dude. Own that trash can. It is your trash can. It will not be full in your house. You know, just own the thing. And, you know, and, I th and, and there is value to that. Without a doubt, there is value to that. You know, who's ever got to do the dishes, own the dishes. You know, it's, it's just like, it's not, it, owning the dishes is not how high they get piled. I could pile a little higher. You know, it's owning that sink to be clean. Right? How many marriages got fixed by doing that? Zero. <laughs> because it was all the stuff underneath. Because then it became a contest. Oh, I'm the dish person? Okay, let's see how the trash person's doing. <laughs> then we start judge, and then it becomes a relationship born of deeds. Loss of intimacy, loss of companion, loss. We're not working together anymore. We're keeping a report card on each other. Trash on Thursday, another F I see. <laughs> So, we need to understand that, that the first principle in that is that faith, relationship with God comes first. And you need to know this, because that will establish how you do your deeds. If I do deeds to be okay, I'll never be okay. I'll always fall short. If I do deeds because I'm okay and there's a plan and purpose in those deeds and it makes a difference in the lives of others and myself, that changes the whole dynamic. So with God, position is first. And we are told this in Ephesians 1, 4. It says this, for he chose us in him before the creation of the world. You need to get this part right so we can jump to deeds. For he chose us in him before the creation of the world to be holy and blameless in his sight. That means before time began, before creation, you were already formed in God's mind. He had already chosen you to be, you did nothing to earn it. He will act on your behalf. You didn't act. And then he says this, why did he do this? In love. In, it says, in love he predestined us for adoption to sonship through Jesus Christ in accordance with his pleasure and will. He loved you before he made creation. So that means he loves you eternally. There was a love for you before anything was made. You! You. Before he made anything, he loved you. And since he loved you outside of this time domain, he loves you in a way that is beyond this time domain, which we call eternity. Or eternal that's you and him and the way he looks at you the way he understands that and he says he had, he did this to adopt us into his family because of this love in accordance with his pleasure and will it made him happy and he wanted to you make God happy I know you guys ought to be going whoa what is wrong with this God? You make him happy. You bring pleasure to him. Because there are some of you sitting out here today that don't think you do. You don't even think you fit in this time. Our friend that Sean was talking about didn't think he fit in this time. That's broken. That is complete disconnect. People go, well, how could you do that? Because he's so disconnected from who his position, and he has no sight for what, what God had in mind. He says this, to the praise of his glorious grace, grace what is undeserved favor, he just wanted to, which he freely given us in the one he loves. It was all done and, it, and demonstrated by an act through the one he loves, which they had a relationship, Father, Son, Holy Spirit have a relationship. God is considered love. God is love. Why? Love is only manifested in relationship. So the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit are three different beings in one who love each other to such a degree that they are one. 
The closest thing we have to that is marriage. And how many know that oneness ebbs and flows? I guess, uh, and even those of us that have children, you know, the, for many of us, that, that love with a child is, is a bond that isn't, but not for everybody. Or we wouldn't have the damage we have. So, he says this, but listen, after you were chosen before he made anything, God formed you and entered you into a time. You're here in this time slot of, the, of God's work in the, the world on purpose. You're supposed to be in this time slot. And David says it very well. He says, listen, in verse 13 of Psalm 139, for you created my inmost being and knit me together in my mother's womb. Do you, I'm going to break something down for you to tell, show you how special you are before we even get into the deed part, the do part, because there is a do part for you. But this is your position. This is the relationship. This is the faith part. If you were to take a page, piece of paper, your DNA sequence to break down your blueprint, your individual blueprint, you would need to take a piece of paper, 800 words typed on a piece of paper, Put it into a book of a thousand pages and then add 1,000 volumes or 600,000 pages to describe you and how God made you. That, can you imagine, 1,000 volumes. You thought Britannica Encyclopedia for us old people was long, <laughs> had a lot of volumes. 1,000 volumes of 1,000 pages and 800 words per page to describe the sequencing that makes you, you, and me, me. He says here, for when you created my inmost being and knit me together in my mother's womb, there is nobody been knit together like you. That is special. That is amazingly special. Can you say, God, thank you. But what about those of us that got some disabilities? Mm, it's all in it. It's all in it. And it's all with a purpose. And there's something to be done with it. It's an amazing comp. And he says this in Psalm 139, 16. Your eyes saw my unformed body. Your eyes, your thought, your seen mind saw me before I was ever formed. So here's the deal. However old you are, before that, you didn't exist. But you were thought about, and you were formed, and you were already chosen before God did anything. So at one point in time, you were simply a thought formed in God's mind. And already chosen to be his. Already sequenced out. And then, at a point in time, you were created. And you came into existence. And then he says this, And all the days ordained for me were written in your book before one of them came to be. There's a thousand volumes about you. And that's only in his book. How big is that book? All your days in this time period. See, this is where the deeds part comes in. All what I told you, you had nothing to do with. God did it. Your faith is to believe that. And then scripture says God has put talents and gifts inside of us. And those are to be developed. That's our works. That's what God, or James, calls works. And James has been telling them that you have works in the trial, you have works in the relationship, you have works, you have multiple works. Then he's going to talk about in chapter 4, and that's what we're diving into the rest of this time period, is you got a job to do. There's a purpose 
for you in this time period. You aren't here just to make it by and get to heaven. You have a job to do, and I'll explain why you have that job to do. But listen, you have to play out your faith with works. You have a responsibility. So let's jump ahead to James chapter 4 and see James talking to some businessmen now. Obviously, before James wrote this letter, he has been getting feedback from where the people have been scattered regarding areas of trouble his flock is having. So he's addressing them. And then he turns and he addresses some deeds that need to be looked at. Is their work life and what are they doing with the plans that they have moving forward? And he says this to them. Now listen, you who say. So he's talking to a group. He's talking those who say this statement, not those who have other businesses. He's saying, listen, today or tomorrow, those who say this, today or tomorrow will go to this or that city, spend a year there, carry on business, and make money. So this is the context of who he's writing to. These guys that think they have so much control, now, hey, they've been scattered. They're trying to figure out how to make a living, what they are to do with their talents and skills. How do we form our life? Same thing that any of you people getting married or have gotten married or thinking about getting married or, or you're graduating school or you're coming out of your junk and you start to look at, what am I going to do? How are we going to do this? What's our new life going to look like? He says, listen, don't be arrogant about it, and we'll read it in a moment, but it's way more than making money. He said to these guys, your, your main thing here is to make money. That's only a slice of the pie. That's only a slice of it. There's much more to this. He says, listen, why, you don't even know what will happen tomorrow. You have limited control. What is your life anyway? You are a mist that appears for a little while and then vanishes. You come into this time period, and you will end living in this time period. You come in for a season. You need to get to the, the place, fellas or ladies, whoever was gathered around the map looking at where they're going to do their business and how they're going to do this, and, and, and thinking that they had great control. And their goal was to make money. God's not against you making money. God's against that being your primary motive. Because that becomes a problem. He says, seek ye first the kingdom of God. Seek first what God wants in your life. And all this other stuff, the money, the house, the, all that stuff will be taken care of. When you seek that, and I talk to people all the time that whose biggest goal is to seek someplace where they can buy a house where they can do this, where they can get, you know, this. That's okay, but what's, why do you want a house? Why people that are going, I'm, I'm going to make a bunch of money, that's okay. Why, though? Why do you want to make the money? If you don't know what those motives are, and a lot of times it's because I was poor, so I want to be the opposite of what I was. Oh, it's all about you then. You don't even know what you're like. So you think God who made this DNA plan of a thousand volumes in your life and put you in this time period so that he could have somebody make some money and get a house? You think that's his big plan? You think that's his will? It may be a slice of it, but it's not his will, all of it. So he's telling these guys, slow down. He says, listen, instead of that, you ought to say this, if it is the Lord's will. Lord, what is your will for me in this timeline? What is your purpose in that thousand volumes, 600,000 pages, 800 words a page, DNA you made of me? What is your purpose for me in this timeline? That's the question you want to ask yourself. How am I to be a blessing here? What is the thing? He says, listen, if it is the Lord's will, we will do this or that. As it is, you boast in your arrogant schemes like you got great control. The same God who made you, made you for a reason and a purpose. And it's one of our favorite sayings around here. You are made on purpose, for a purpose, with a purpose. And you'll be accountable 
for that purpose. He says this, all such boasting is evil. If anyone then knows the good they ought to do, and that's the antidote. What is the good I'm supposed to do here? That's got to be my primary motive. What is the good I'm supposed to do here for the kingdom? What is that deed? See, that's where faith and deeds come in. That's where the rubber really meets the road. Sometimes we get confused with faith and deeds, and we think it's all about don't do this and don't do that. and don't do. It's about what am I here for? What am I supposed to do? How am I supposed to impact this world? What is it going to take for me to do that? What is the good I'm supposed to do? And he used the good singular, but it's, it's plural. If I'm married, the good is to be a good husband. Not to be gone all the time. If I'm a father, the good is to be a good father. If I'm a business person, the good is to be a good business person and give back. There's there's good in what is the good? And then do the good. And then he says, if you don't do the good, that is sin for them. That is the sin for you. God's not impressed with one slice of the pie of your life doing great. He's a workaholic, amazing workaholic. God's that, God, you know, what, what, why are you doing that? See, when you start to ask why, then you start to reveal the, the, well, what is my motive here? Oh, I have such low self-esteem that if I have all the tote bells and whistles and all this and that, then I look like somebody. So that's the good thing here? That's what we call the good? I don't know, I know everybody's going... Tell me about not looking at porn, please. (laughs) Right? Because now this stuff hits us at home. This stuff is like, well, what do I do with all my time? Well, I think the good should be watching every, every series on Netflix. Spending days and nights looking at that because that's in that's good, that's important. That's why God put me in this time period. If he didn't want me watching TV to put me with the cowboys. Poor God. Made a mistake again. Listen. Why is this important? Why is it important what we do? Who cares? What does it mean? Shouldn't I just work and be a good guy at home and then, you know, die and go to heaven? Isn't that what we're supposed to do in this time period? No. That's not what only we're supposed to do. Why? Because it tells us this. In uh, Daniel 7, 18, he says, But the holy people of the Most High will receive the kingdom and will possess it forever. Yes, forever. What does that mean? That means you are in practice now in this time period to learn the skills necessary to possess the kingdom of God. You know what possess means? It means rule over, control a property, a portion of something. That's what God's kids are supposed to do. We're supposed to learn the three C's. This is what God's work in your life is always about. And and then it even goes farther than that in Revelation 5.11. I'll tell you three C's in a minute. But Revelation 5.10, it says this. You have made them, us, to be a kingdom. We belong to a kingdom. But we're also the kingdom. We are an extension of the kingdom and priest, representatives of God, to serve our God, then they will reign on the earth. Possess means to control property. Reign means to have authority over. You are being trained by God in this time period for a greater work in the establishing of his kingdom forever and ever. If you've ever had the idea that your job is to go to heaven and sing hymns all day and sit on clouds and be chubby and shoot little arrows, you are sadly mistaken. If you think heaven and the the work of God in the big picture is for you to be in church 24-7, you think these verses and songs sometimes are long, and you're going to sing 24-7 in heaven? 
you know what? What's behind door number two? You got a job to do, and you are in preparation of, for that job. So you need the three C's that God is always do, doing in our lives. Character, competency, and chemistry. God is developing your character. If you're going to reign in the kingdom of God, you better first learn to reign in your life. So some of us in here are at the very beginning of learning to reign over our lives. And you've wondered why I haven't exploded in, in other areas and, and become this or that because character is being built in you. You can't control it. And James talked to those guys about controlling the mouth, and you'll hear about that one later another day. He says, you, you can't control yourself. What do you expect to control God's kingdom? Competency. God expects you to become competent in your skills. That means you grow in them. You master them. There is a skill set. He said to these guys going to get the business, listen, you need to slow down and make sure that when you're doing where you're going to go to make money, what else are you going to do with that? How is that going to be good for the kingdom? How is that going to be good in the bigger picture? Some of us think our job in Christianity is to criticize. My job is to critique. I critique, and mainly other Christians, Hey, it's, hey we're, we're called to hold each other accountable. But what are you doing to help? How many know that criticism has never really been that great of a help in your life? I don't need people to criticize me. This head does it all the time. I need people to help me. I told you about my board years ago when we were in the, the deepest depression of my ministry life, and I've had a number of them. And my board was coming to my house every day and showing up on the wall. How, how, how many know this story? Anybody? Oh, good. A story you haven't heard. <laughs> we were on a downward spiral. And I know it's tough to be on a downward spiral when you have 40. So that's a bad spiral. And so, and we had no money. Monies were horrible. And we were trying to, I was lost in what I was supposed to do. And I, I lost my passion and heart. And, and I, I, you know, the adventure of what I was supposed to do. They would come over to my house with a projector. We, and they'd show, us, show me on the wall. We'd take a picture off my wall, and they'd show me on the wall where we were doing lousy this month. And, uh, you know, and, 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 and finally I said, you know what? I'm not going to say exactly what I said here, but I, I said, <laughs> I turned off the projector, and I said, you know what, that on the wall? I don't give a, about it. I don't care. Here's, the, here's what I care about. Are you guys going to help me? Because I can get any four guys to critique me. What are you going to do to help? Carrying a projector and doing numbers, you think that's helping? What are, what are we going to do? Here's what we're going to do. I'm going to give you guys a month, you know, to figure out if you want to be on this thing with me, and then we'll, we'll go from there. They all resigned. But it was cool. Now I know. I was free. And then, then, then God said, okay, Joe. Your character and your competency was that. You want to go out this way and do some good? It's going to take some change in you. And I'm telling you this because you're in that same boat. Some of you, see, some of us in here are flowing in the zone that God has created us for because you've been created for something. And some of us aren't. Some of us are looking for it. Some of us are struggling. So we have three C's. God wants you character-wise. He wants you competent to fulfill what he's placed in you. If he took a thousand volumes, part of that is your giftings, like, as Paul tells us, and your talents. You have to do something with that. And that has to grow because oftentimes we're fearful. There's two kinds of people usually. It's here's an opportunity. Yeah! I don't know nothing about it. I'm just going. I just hit every wall. I didn't know. I don't know where a door is. They're just gung-ho. And here's the other person on the other end of the spectrum. Here's an opportunity. I can't do it. I'm too afraid. It's, 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 it's going to take. And they back away. I'm more the fearful guy. I have become much more the middle dude. Because, you know, I, I don't run anymore. It's like, that's a good idea. We might need to do that and stuff. And, and I'm going to approach it methodically. 
Some of us can't do things methodically, and we think that's somehow a bad thing. No, it's a good thing. It's a good thing. Slow down. And then some of us need to get out of your fear boat. So God wants us competent. And then the third one is chemistry. You've got to get along with people. The Bible tells us over and over and over and over and over again, love, 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 love. So how do you love people? He puts you around people unlovable. Love them. No. <laughs> Bring me the people I can love. I, I, I do. The people you can love, they're always being brought to you. What we don't know how to do is love. So char character, competency, and uh, chemistry are needed for you that have to be. That's the works of faith and work. God's got it all out there for you. But you have to become skilled in those things. And this is the crazy part. Any one of those failures drops the other two. Anybody know anybody that was ever super competent, but a complete jerk? And nobody wanted to hang around them. Nobody wanted to buy from them. Nobody wanted to be there. Why? Because they were missing chemistry. How many know, how many have ever seen anybody that has wonderful character? I love that girl. I love her. She's so kind and gracious. Okay, we're going to have her work on your team at work. No, 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 no. Love hanging out in the break room. Totally incompetent. Character, competence, chemistry. God is building all of those in you. He may be working on one right now because you may be very competent, but your character is killing your competency. You may have great character, you, 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 you know, he, and sometimes God, see, can't, uh, can't enrich us to do good because our character won't allow it. We undermine it all the time. So God goes, okay, we'll shrink that down. But I'm super competent. Yeah, but your character sucks. You can't handle it. Give you $100 and you, you keep 27 of it. You're supposed to put it all in there. You're supposed to do all of that. Your character is who you are in secret. And God knows. He says that I don't, I, character is not two different people. The public one, private one. They're one person. Your private and your public life ought to be very similar. So he's always building those. And you are responsible for those works. God did his faith part and he gives us the Holy Spirit to help us. Everybody following me? So this, so this is a great example Jesus gives us in Matthew 25, backing up what I've been telling you about James in parable form. And he's talking to the people, and he says this in verse 14 of Matthew 24. He says, again, it will be like a man going on a journey. There was a man. He went on a journey. So a time period was going to take place between him beginning the journey and him coming back from the journey, there's this time period. Same thing we've been talking about. He says, who called his servants. Oh, they had relationship. That was a faith thing. They already had relationships. They knew who they were in the relationship. They were the servant connected to the master. It says, and he entrusted them or trusted his wealth to them. He trusted them to do something with his stuff. That he's giving them. The exact analogy is what I've been talking about. You have a relationship with God, except you're even beyond a child. I mean a servant. You're a child of God. And they're two different things. Because sometimes people look at that passage and go, that's a passage about salvation. No, it's not. It's a passage about doing the do. After you have faith. Because if your faith is all you have, yeah, the faith thing is a God thing. You're a child of God. The do thing is important because that's what you're going to be doing. Don't ever fall under the, the, the misconception that your work doesn't count and that you got to just take a job to make money. Take a job to make money while you're going and finding your zone to be, do good in this world. Why? Because it's a practice for what God has for you. You're a teacher? Teach. You're a builder? Build. You're a people person? People. Something. <laughs> okay. 
So he does this. So he disperses his wealth. It says, to one he gave five bags of gold, to another two bags, and to another one bag, each according to his ability, his present ability. His present ability. See, God is letting you handle right now what is your present ability. He's not, he doesn't want it to stay there. He wants you to expand and become more competent. Build chemistry. He wants you to do good. He wants you to do good. He wants you to increase in value to kingdom work. Not your position as a child. He's already got a thousand volumes on you. He's already chose you before creation. That's not you. That's him. You guys with me on that? You need to understand that because it's a big deal. So he says this. He gave the, another one one bag, each according to his ability. Then he went on his journey. The man who had received five bags of gold went at once and put his money to work. He put his skills, what was entrusted to him. You and I would look at that scripturally speaking as, as talents and treasures and time. He put them to work, increasing their value. He says, and he gained, gains another word for work, produced. Five more bags more. So also the one with two bags of gold gained two more, did the same thing. But the one man who had received one bag went off, dug a hole in the ground, and hid his master's money. At, so one guy took that same, according to his ability, he was given gifts. According to his ability. He didn't have a lot in the, compared to the others, but he, it was enough for him. He took it and buried it. Which means he didn't do anything with it. But then he went and lived his life. The master was gone on a long journey. He had a long time, just as long as the other guys did. He did nothing to build that, to increase it, to become competent, to work on his chemistry, to build character. All those things did nothing. Whatever he did, he just wasted time. So, we get to verse 19, and it tells us this. After a long time, the master of those servants returned and settled accounts with them. Give an account of yourself. See, you and I, we will all face God one day. And we will be held accountable for the talents and gifts he has put in us and what we did with them. It's a big deal. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, it's a big deal, because we're going to look at the one bad guy here in a couple minutes. But know this, this isn't about salvation. This is about kingdom preparation so that you can reign and rule with God forever. He cannot let you, and he'll say it later on in this chapter, he cannot let you rule and reign with him forever. Oh, you can be in the kingdom. You'll be outside of that group, though. You'll be outside of that group. Because you didn't learn, you're not capable. And God is any, if you're not capable, God won't do it. If you're feeling stuck right now in some area of your life, it's because you're probably at the end of the spectrum that you're fearful to take a risk to go and develop that area for whatever your fears are. I can't, it's too much school, it's too hard, it's too high, it's over there, I'm not lucky, I'm stupid. And whatever your excuses are, and what we're going to find out here is none of those roll with God. They don't roll. He doesn't go with your excuses and goes, I didn't know that. <laughs> You're right. So it says this. He comes back after this long time. The beautiful thing about a long time is God gives you an opportunity to fail. You know, failing is part of learning. It's part of you becoming competent. I'm not good at this. Yeah, that's why you failed in it. So now you can learn from that. If you don't internalize it as I'm bad, I'm stupid, I don't know how. No, that's a learning thing. That's why it's a long time. Maybe the guy with five bags invested two and lost them both. But he still had three, so he's figuring out what can I do with these three. And then over this period of time, he was able to increase. He became more competent. And as he became more competent, he had to develop chemistry. 
If you're going to take five bags and, and develop and into ten bags, you're going to have to deal with people. He, whatever he was selling, whatever he was doing, he had to learn to be a good businessman. He had to learn some people skills. He didn't have to join every fight he was invited to. He didn't have to whatever. And then his character had to be such that he had to meet his needs. But he learned that there was a bigger thing going. And the relationship was, I have a master who I'm going to have to report to. I want to do a good job because there's a bigger picture involved. God's a promoter. He wants us to do well. So it says, the man who would receive, where are we at? Five, uh, 20. The man who would receive five bags of gold brought the other five. Master, he said, you entrusted me with five bags of gold, so I have gained five more. The master replied, well done, good and faithful servant. Well done, good and faithful. You did good. The good you did, you helped. And you were faithful. You have been faithful with a few things. You know what's crazy? How many of us in here think we got so many things going on? We got so many things. God says, it's a few things. Oh, that thing you think is so big and so many and so hard and so la 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 la. He says, it's a few. Be faithful in it. Grow in it. Become competent in it. Order it. Get your competency skill up. Get your character. You need to grow in your character to be able to handle a number of things well. God is not impressed. Oh, yeah, I'm a juggler. That's not impressive. How many can juggle like that? I can juggle one ball. Juggling four balls, whole different game. That takes practice and skill and competency and character to be able to learn to do it. How many have tried that? How many have done the yo-yo? It doesn't come back. Up. <laughs> done with that. Then you got those other guys. <laughs> they didn't just fall out of a tree and do that. These are people that have gained character and competence. They stuck with it. Take it to a bigger picture. You want a good marriage? Get competent in it. <laughs> hey, buddy. You want any good relationship? Get competent in it. Learn chemistry. I didn't say sexuality. Chemistry. Character. It's always being worked. You don't get anything out of today, get the three C's. And know that God's always working on one or more of those. And calling you to be. And every, see, he had to scatter James is writing to these guys and say, you guys had to get scattered. Some of you have been scattered. You've been scattered in your own life. You've gone here, you've gone there, you've done this, you've done that. All that scattering is God working you into the place. Some of us just want to get comfortable. You're not going to be comfortable in the kingdom of God. If I just have enough money, I'll be comfortable. Oh, is that what you think? Then I'll take it away. I don't want you comfortable. I want you productive. I don't want a lazy servant. I want a productive servant. Why? Because there's a future for you. It's huge. It's a big deal. So he says this. He says, uh, I will put you in charge of many things. Come and share your master's happiness. This makes me happy. This is all, it makes you happy. This is a good thing. Then it says, the man with two bags of gold came. Master, he said, you entrust me with two bags. I see... I, see, I have gained two more. His master replied, well done, good and faithful servant. You have been faithful with a few things. He didn't even judge between the ten and the four. He said, you, oh, you've been good. You handled it. You became more competent. Good thing. I will put you in charge of anything. I'm going to give you more opportunity to grow in your character, competency, competency and, and what's the other one? Perfect. So, Come and share in your master's happiness. Then the man who had re received one bag of gold came. Master, he said, I knew that you are a hard man, harvesting where you have not sown and gathering where you have not scattered seed. So I was afraid. Afraid is the killer of development. So I was afraid and went out and hid your gold in the ground. See, here is what belongs to you. So here's, the, here's the, the, where this guy's messed up in this thinking. 
One is he thought he could identify the character of his master, and he was way off. So the master, so, and some of us have that same idea about God. The same God who made me took a thousand volumes, 600,000 pages to design me, doesn't want to help me, doesn't want to care. He just doesn't care anymore. He will not help me to develop. He will not show me new ways. He will not take me from where I am. I'm all alone. He's mean. He, he, scat he expects a harvest, it says, where he scatters no seed. He does nothing to make a harvest, but he expects you to come up with one. The master's looking at him. He goes, you read me all wrong. And this is the other thing the guy did. He still thought they had good relationship. I'm your servant. I'm your servant. We're still master servant here. Huh. His master replied, you wicked servant. So you knew that I harvest where I have not sown and gather where I have not scattered seed? You, you, you know that about me? You're saying that's the way I roll? Well then, let me roll that way with you. You should have put my money on deposit with the bankers. So that when I returned, I would have received it back with interest. He said, if you were really afraid that I was greedy and stuff, he says, the least thing you could have done is put it in the bank and I would have got some interest. I lost money with you. For a long time, that sun had under the ground. I didn't even get So if you were really afraid, you would have done something to at least give me something from it. So you're even a liar. So here's the deal. This guy's failure was threefold. And it's... The failure he has is the failure that we will have too. Or we can develop and realize that God is going to develop the three C's in us. That's what sin has to do with character. Competency has to do with you being able to handle whatever it is God has gifted you with well and increase it. Chemistry is your ability to deal with people because that's what it's all about anyway. So he says, so this is what the guy's failure was. The first one is this. Number one, he believed he would not be held accountable. He buried what God had specifically, or his master had specifically told him to develop. He buried it. He thought he could face God and not be accountable for that. He found out hardcore that when God gives you talents and giftings, which he gives to each one of his kids according to their initial ability and capability, he expects you to do something with it, and you will be held accountable for it. Second problem he had, he thought his excuses were valid. How many of us have hid what God has done? You know God wants to do something with you, but you make all these excuses. When I wanted to be in ministry, when I was driving the beer truck, I was crying out to God, how am I ever going to do this? How am I ever going to be? I can't go to seminary. And we start to make these excuses and build. I've already passed this. I got three little kids. How am I going to go to education? How can I take it? I should just drive the beer truck. I couldn't get high enough. And that's the problem. When we're doing something outside of our zone, we have to do something to enable us to do it. But when you're in your zone, life flows. So here's what happened. The only thing I thought was to ask my pastor. See, what all God requires of you to, take, to grow in that next step of wherever it is, character competency or chemistry, is for you to take the next indicated step. For me, it was to go to my pastor at a church in, in Orange and tell him I wanted to, I want to be a pastor. I don't know how to do it. I don't know how to do it. And he just started to meet with me. And then from there, he pointed to another door, and that's the door I went into. And from there, he pointed to another one. And from there, things started happening. And it was a long process. Then I got into church, and it took me 10 years to get over 50 people. And that's with my family who came just because, God, I feel so sorry for Joe. And their kids were going, I don't feel that sorry. Like, how about one Sunday a month? <laughs> hey, 
And the third one was this. It was his mistake. He still thought he would be rewarded for doing nothing. He got in line with the other two guys. Right in line behind Mr. Tenbagger and Mr. Fourbagger. Got his one bag. Here you go, Lord. I did nothing. <laughs> what do I get here? What's my reward? Because you get nothing, Mr. Lazy. Here's what you get. You get to be on the outside looking at all the other servants. And don't call yourself my servant. Well, you're my child. Could be my child. But you're not my servant. You're not in a position to be a servant leader. You learn nothing. You hit it. How can I put you in charge of anything? You said I was mean. So you didn't even ask me for help. You didn't even ask, send a letter and ask for help. You didn't do nothing. You didn't ask Mr. Fourbagger or Tenbagger for help. You didn't do nothing. So what do you get? You get nothing. So don't fall for that, you guys. Listen, you have been gifted. A thousand volumes contain what you're about. You have a due part. James says this. You have faith. Show me your deeds. Show me, show me where you're taking. I'm not telling you to be crazy risk. I'm telling you to take some risk. Starts with first take. You're a family. Take care of your family. That's your first responsibility. How can you serve in the kingdom of God if you don't even take care of your family? I know a guy that once left his family to serve Jesus. They had to go. And, and, and he, he, he became a single man missionary. Wife and kid, they had to go live with mom because he was serving Jesus. And boy, was he self-righteous about it. I am suffering for Jesus. And I think they're suffering. They're suffering for you. That's, you you're not competent. Your chemistry sucks. And your character, mm, not a work. So guess what happened to him? Nothing. Guess what his ministry came to? Nothing. Until he came back. And God rewarded him. This is the other thing. God rewards you in effort. Two bags to two bags, that's a good effort. I can keep going on, but you guys probably want to go home. And uh, I know the children's church does. So let's go, Joe, and wrap this up. Stand up, people. Can we say this? Dear Jesus, I own... My competency, my chemistry with others, and my character. I own that. I am responsible to develop that. And I can count on you and your Holy Spirit to help me. So I'm not making any more excuses. And I'm not blaming anybody. I am going to grow. In every area of my life, because I am a kingdom builder. And I will reign with God. Don't die on me now on this. I will reign with God forever. Start to go down. I will. Own the, um, <laughs> and all God's kids said, Amen. God bless you guys.